In this video, I'm going to explain how data scientists figure out if the data they have collected can be used for predicting future events. This is important because if a system is in a state of rapid change when the data is collected, the predictions based on that data won't be accurate. I will also show you how we applied this method in a real-world project that involved studying how neurons in a rat's brain reacted to a small dosage of cocaine. Hi, I'm Adam Borzu. If this is your first time watching my videos, let me introduce myself. I have a PhD in high energy physics where I analyze data from the CMS experiment. I also hold a master's degree in mathematical physics, which helps me build models for new types of data. I have been a data science fellow at US National Library of Medicine. Also, I worked as a postdoctoral researcher at Syracuse University working on living matter data. And now I run a data analysis consulting firm named Compufiler. Imagine you have collected stock market data on the 2nd of March 2020 to predict how the market would look in the future. Would your prediction be accurate for the market status by the end of the same month? Well, now that we are in the future of 2020, the answer is clearly no, because we know that the system, the market, completely changed after we collected data. In other words, the market was in a state of rapid and unpredictable change when the data was collected. So how can we tell if the data we have collected can predict what will happen in the future? In other words, was there a way to answer this question right at the time the data was collected? In this video, I will present a method that we recently applied to a real world project to answer this question. In this project, we wanted to see if the neurons in a certain region of a rat's brain or stable or not. And we wanted to answer this question under two conditions, when the rat was living a normal life and also when the rat was administered a small dose of cocaine. In this experiment, a virus was injected to a small part of a rat brain. This virus makes certain neurons produce a protein that lights up when the neurons are active, allowing to track brain activity. After that, a tiny lens was implemented in the rat's brain this lens is like a microscope that lets researchers see the glowing neurons inside the brain. Then the rat's brain activity was recorded for 30 minutes. After that, the rat was given cocaine and its brain activity was recorded for another 30 minutes. The recorded movies of the activity of neurons were then pre-processed to generate a spreadsheet with the columns being the intensity of light emitted from the neurons in the rat brain. Every row of the spreadsheet was a snapshot of all those neurons simultaneously. Every snapshot, every row, was taken in time intervals of 0.1 seconds. Just to know, this type of data is called time series. For the stability analysis that I'm going to discuss in this video, each cell of the spreadsheet turned into a binary minus 1 or 1 form. To understand what minus 1 and 1 mean in this spreadsheet, let me briefly explain how the brain performs its cognitive tasks through the activation and non-activation of neurons inside the brain. Neurons in the brain communicate through electrical impulses called action potentials, and their interactions form the basis of complex processes like memory, thought, decision-making, etc. Each neuron receives input from other neurons through dendrites and sends output to its axons. When a neuron receives enough excitatory signals from other neurons, the total input reaches a critical threshold, triggering the neuron to a spike or fire. This electrical signal travels through the axon, releasing chemicals called neurotransmitters across small gaps between neurons called synapses. These neurotransmitters then influence neighboring neurons, either exciting them, making them more likely to spike, or inhibiting them, making them less likely to spike. In our spreadsheet, a minus one represents a neuron that was not spiking, or was inactive, at the time the snapshot was taken. A plus one indicates the neuron was spiking, or was active, at the time the snapshot was taken. For example, in this row of the spreadsheet, the first neuron is active, the second neuron is also active, and the third neuron is inactive. And you can interpret the rest of the rows and columns 
in the same way. One of the goals of this study was to find out if the collected neurons that we are observing are randomly firing independently of each other or if there is an alignment between them. And one good indicator for the degree of alignment between neurons is inspired by statistical mechanics of magnetic moments in physics and is called magnetization. It is simply defined as the sum of all the cells in one row of the spreadsheet. Since the states of neurons are shown with minus 1 and 1, if neurons have fired randomly, we should see the sum to be 0 in most of the rows. But if we see the sum, the magnetization, is significantly above 0, we can conclude that there is a degree of alignment between neurons. In machine learning, this process of creating a meaningful variable, a feature, out of some original variables is often referred to as feature engineering. So at this point, I have a spreadsheet with just one color, feature, called magnetization, that measures the degree of alignment between neurons we have observed. Now we can use this engineered feature to study if the network of neurons is stable or not. That means we want to see if the system of neurons will soon undergo a rapid change or if it is in a steady state. And we want to study this under the two experimental conditions, before the administration of the drug and after it. In another video, I explained in depth how the stability of a system and its probability distribution are related. If you haven't seen that video, I recommend watching it. But for now, let me quickly summarize. The columns in my spreadsheet obey a certain probability distribution of the following form, which I like to call the God equation. Just like a ball inside a bowl that rolls toward the bottom of the bowl under gravity, the data in the spreadsheet will roll toward the minimum of this F, which acts effectively as the free energy of the system. Therefore, the system we are observing and collecting data from is stable only if it is already at the minimum of this free energy. That means our goal is to find out if the system is at minimum or not. To answer that, I will write F in the form of a Taylor series. Assuming that the system is at the minimum, the lower order terms are more significant than the higher order terms. So I will keep up to the fourth order and neglect the rest. Then I will use methods like maximum likelihood, which I'm going to cover in the next video, or other methods like kernel density estimator, which I would like to cover in a future video to estimate the constants of the Taylor series. After the constants of the Taylor series are estimated from the collected data, I can now plot f as a function of the variables in my spreadsheet in this case, the magnetization parameter. If, as I assumed, the system is stable, the minimum of the plot must be where the mean of the variable is. If the plot doesn't have a minimum, or its minimum is not at the mean of my spreadsheet data, my stability assumption was not correct, and the system is not stable. Now let me show you what the free energy of the magnetization of the neurons in our experiment looks like. As you can see, the curve that belongs to the before administration of cocaine has a minimum at the mean of the magnetization and is therefore stable. However, the curve that belongs to data collected after the administration of cocaine does not have a minimum. Therefore, that system is not stable and will rapidly change after my observation. So now I have a quantitative way to measure the instability of the brain under drugs. I can also conclude that I cannot use the data collected after cocaine administration to predict the future of its neuronal activity because the system will not stay as it was when I collected the data. I hope you have enjoyed this video. Take care and I will see you in the next video.